You can be seated. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth, eighth, not for long, but the 845 service of the Tuscola United Methodist Church. We extend a special welcome to any guests that we might have today. Be sure to sign the registration pad at the end of the rows. And if you have a prayer request, the slips are in the baskets. Fill them out and pass them to the outside of the aisle, and the usher or ushers will pick them up. Are there any announcements? Well, I have a couple of announcements I want to share with you. Uh, first, uh, just a reminder, it is cold and flu season, and that also means COVID season now. So I just want to remind you to be extra careful, maybe take a minute to uh, sanitize your hands when you come in and you leave. Uh, we have certain people who are wearing masks, and that's great if you feel if you are worried or have the need to protect people, I invite you, encourage you to do that. Uh, we have a lot of people out today because of cold and flu. Um, this, not this Tuesday, but the next Tuesday, we will be holding our blue Christmas service. I heartily encourage you to attend. It is a soft, quiet service celebrating Christmas uh, from a more serene point of view less the manic joyfulness that we usually associate with Christmas and more a calm, quiet event that allows space for grief, for pain, and for suffering this time of year. On Christmas Eve, we have two Christmas Eve services, the 7 p.m. family service. Bring your grandkids, bring your kids, bring your nephews and nieces, we are going to be telling the story through Reader's Theater and some acting and some really fun ways uh, of audience participation. So I encourage you to bring any little ones you know to the family service. And we have our traditional service at 11 p.m. with Silent Night and candles and all of the things that you've come to expect on Christmas Eve. Remember that we will be having a service uh, on Christmas Day. I am really excited about this. Wear your comfy tree wrapping present, unwrapping present clothes. Don't dress up. Come together and sing and uh, celebrate Christ's birth in a short service. Um, and finally, starting Christmas Day and forever forward until we change our minds again. Hopefully it won't be for a long time. One service at 9 a.m. But if you get here early, you can listen to Judy play the organ and it will bless you, I promise. So, I Judy's, here. <laughs> Judy's always here. <laughs> you can always come early and listen to music, but we want to celebrate together. Those are all the announcements I have. Does anyone else have any further announcements? Then let's welcome God's presence in our midst as we listen to the prelude. <laughs> Thank you. 
you, Kathy, for the lovely prelude, and thanks to Judy for our organ music before for the service. That was lovely, too. Please stand for the call to worship as you are able. The Liberator is on the way. We're watching and waiting. waiting. The Liberator will arrive soon. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your heads. So that the Liberator can come in. We are watching, we are waiting, we are anticipating. The coming of our Liberator, the King of Glory, the Savior of the world. tells us that the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much a joy. The psalmist says, happy are these whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. Thank you. 
Charlie. I see Ezra and Julia back there. They're getting stuff done. If Ezra and Julia aren't coming up, Charlie's not coming up. Is what I'm getting from that. <laughs> Here comes Julia. It just takes a minute sometimes. Charlie, you want to come up with Julia? Thank you. We're all sleepy and tired today. Goodness, what do I do to the kids up here? I, I, I didn't bring my beating stick today, I promise. <laughs> hey guys, you can actually come all the way up here and take a look at this with me. Yeah, let's take a look at our manger. Remember, this is a, does anybody remember what kind of building this is supposed to be? It's, you just stand up there with her. Some days they're like this. Charlie, you know what kind of building this was supposed to be? Do you remember? A barn. A barn is what we call it. It's uh, where we think Jesus was born in a stable. And so we always have one of these to represent Jesus. Now, the first week, the only thing we had in the whole barn was what? Animals, because animals live in the barn. But last week, we added God's presence through an angel so that we know God is watching over this special holy place. Well, this week, we have some people who traveled really long to get here. Does anybody know who traveled to get to this barn? How about out there? Do you guys have some guesses? Now, we're not talking wise men yet, but who else traveled to get here? Joseph and Mary. Mary and Joseph are Jesus' mom and dad. And they came a long, long way down some really dusty roads, and they didn't have good shoes. Do you like to walk? I, I like to walk, but I don't know if I'd want to walk all the way to Bethlehem. That would take a long time. But they are here, and because there's no room in the inn, they have to live inside a barn for now. Does that seem fair? Have you ever lived in a barn? I haven't either. I think a barn would be cold. Anybody out here have barns on your property or did when you were a kid? What are barns like in January? Cold. What are barns like in July? Hot and stinky because you get flies and animal poop. And it's, so I wouldn't want to live there. It's not a nice place. But it shows that Jesus came to be with us wherever we are. Even if we're in a cold, stinky barn, Jesus is there. All right, we're going to say a prayer, but you're not going to go right back to children's moment because we're going to stay and hear the choir anthem today because Omi's playing. So we'll say a prayer, and then we'll, uh, you'll go back with your moms and then follow Miss Cheryl out in a minute. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to be with us even in dark, stinky, smelly barns. We love you. Amen. All right. <laughs> you can go up there by yourself. Go up.
for our offertory, I want to share with you that you should be receiving a letter very early this week. Uh, it should be, it's supposed to go out tomorrow about our Advent offering that we collect every year. We always try to uh, find a situation in need that we can help alleviate with some of our financial blessings. We've done everything from supporting overseas missions to uh, to last year uh, giving money towards the flood victims in Gibson City. This year we have one that's a lot closer to home I want to share with you. One of our mops moms, uh, her son Nash, who is eight, was diagnosed with an incredibly rare disease called vanishing white matter. Uh, it is incredible. It is a really bad disease, I'm just gonna say that. The prognosis is not very good, usually. He's in a good position. However, because it's genetic, they're in the process of testing all of their children. There's a 25% likelihood that each child has this disease and a 50% likelihood that they are a carrier. Now, this disease is so rare that there is only one doctor in the entire world who treats it and they live in the Netherlands. So this family is, they've already gotten expedited passports. They are prepared to have to travel quite a bit over the next few years. Um, their lives have been turned absolutely upside down. And so this year, I will ask you to give generously to our Advent offering, all of which will go directly to the Nash family to cover travel and medical expenses as they navigate the very challenging situation that they have found themselves in. I can also tell you that I know they would appreciate prayers quite a bit. Um, I, I know there's four children, there may be five, I'm not sure, but there's a good number of children in the family. They are supposed to find out this week the results of all the genetic testing, so I will continue to keep you posted. And now I invite the ushers to come forward as we collect this morning's tithes and offerings. <laughs> Your care for us is unmending, and our lives are filled with hope. 
Receive our thanks and fill us with your spirit as we offer our gifts to you during this Advent season. Through Christ we pray. Amen. The first reading, the first scripture reading for today comes from Matthew, Matthew 11, verses 2 through 11. When John heard in prison that the Messiah, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come? Who are we to wait for another? Or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf ear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before we begin our before before we begin our time of prayer, um, this is part of our prayer time because this affects those that we love. Uh, and two things to let you know. One is we will be doing our poinsettias this year in memory for those that we have lost or in honor of those whom we love. Uh, the form is right out there on the uh, desk. You may pick one up as you go off and they are only $5 each this year. We decided <clears throat> this year to buy them directly from the grocery store in order to kind of help save some uh, some of your uh, hard-earned money. We know inflation is hitting everyone. And so for $5, you can have a poinsettia in honor or in memory of someone up here, and we'll list those people in our bulletin for Christmas Eve. And then, of course, this time of year, we cannot forget those that we love who are homebound uh, or are in uh, assisted living or in the nursing homes. This is as updated as we can possibly get, and it changes daily, a list of all of our people this year and where they are. Again, you may find that on that back table. Please take this list, pray for those on it. Uh, maybe send them a Christmas card full of love and, and warm wishes from their church. Um, a few other prayer requests that I have. Uh, Marlene Phillips, many of you know, just a few weeks ago, on a Sunday morning, her 30-year-old uh, granddaughter was killed in a motorcycle accident. Uh, on Tuesday, it would be her 31st birthday. And so her family in Texas and her family here in Illinois are going to be holding a celebration of life service for her in Mattoon. It's at 6 p.m. If you are interested in going, please talk to me after the service and I will make sure you have all of the information. Um, she left behind some children. She left behind a grieving spouse. It's it's very difficult time. So please lift that family up in your prayers. Um, I got to visit with Gene Stroll this week in his uh, in Meadowbrook. He is uh, he still had COVID when I saw him, but he was already feeling much better and uh, was planning to get to walk down to the library and pick up a good mystery soon. That was what he was wanting was a good mystery. Uh, it was a beautiful facility and he seems very comfortable. But please continue to keep him in your prayers as he makes this journey through hospice and towards the end of his life. Do you have any prayers or praises you'd like to share this morning? Then let's go to God in the time of prayer. God of delight and surprises, you come to us each day with opportunity to love and support. You pour your blessings on us and you remind us of your compassionate presence with us. 
Help us to be people of service. Help us to see the ways in which you enter our lives and enable us to serve you by serving your people. As we have come to you this day, bringing our concerns for healing and hope, remind us that you are with us all and that your healing mercies are given. Give us the courage to be faithful stewards of your creation and bring us together with one another in celebration and service. Lift us up, bring us forward, give us peace. God, would you bless this week, Jean and Marlene and the Nash family. Keep your presence close to them and keep peace in their hearts. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? <laughs> is Mild He Lays His Glory By. 
but it could have been one of so many beautiful, rich, evocative phrases. Sometimes when we sing songs, we don't think about what the words mean. But listen to some of the phrases from this song I could have used for a title. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead seen. God and sinners reconciled. Sounds like the title of the song right there. Or risen with healing in his wings. What? That is just beautiful imagery. All of these show how amazingly deep God and the, the relationship between God and Jesus Christ and humanity are. But I chose mild he lay his glories by. And we'll talk about why in a minute. But the big question you might be wondering is how I ended up in Philippians right before Christmas. That's not a Christmas scripture. It doesn't tell about angels. It doesn't tell about the baby being born. It doesn't tell anything like that. Well, how I got to this very un-Christmassy scripture is a bit of a journey. I'll invite you to go along with me on that journey. This hymn begins with a beautiful opening line. Hark the herald angels sing. First of all, for you grammar people, do you know that the T in hark the herald angels sing is not capitalized? It is hark, exclamation point, lowercase the herald angels sing. Now that seems silly if you're not a grammar person and you're going, why do I care? Why does she talk about things like this? Because it's important, because it shows that this is meant to be one big sentence. Hark, the herald angels are singing. Listen, they're singing. But it's so important for you to listen that they put an exclamation point in the middle of the sentence, which doesn't just mean Oh, listen, the angels are singing. It means, wake up, listen, the angels are singing. It becomes a command. It becomes an imperative. This song is going to tell you some important things. And if that sentence is right at the beginning of the song, we know we got some good stuff coming. Now, one of the things I do when I prepare sermons is I like to look up words, even words that I know but that I don't use very often, to see if my understanding of the word is correct or deep enough or uh, formal enough. And in this case, I didn't know enough about the word herald. I thought I did, but I didn't. A herald is an official messenger for a king. A herald speaks the king's <laughs> words directly. A herald is one of the most trustworthy positions because think about back in times before there were phones and even telegraphs. If you called, uh, if you sent your messenger to someone, they better speak your words because they could cause a war if they said the wrong thing. And I'm sure there were some probably untrustworthy heralds out in the day. But heralds are often in movies and books as well. A herald is, a, is someone who tells you things are about to change. A great adventure is just ahead. Some famous heralds in some famous movies. Star Wars, the herald is C-3PO when he finds himself being sold in Tatooine. My husband would be so proud, I know that name. He'd be so proud. Uh, and, and he tells them that, that Leia's in danger and there's great adventure and suddenly this kid with no plan for a life other than fixing robots is zooming around galaxies and saving the worlds. Harry Potter, one of my favorite books and uh, movies. In Harry Potter, anybody know who the Herald would be who tells Harry things are about to change? Wow. The owl is the non-human one, and who's the human one who comes in and says, things are different? Hagrid. When Hagrid pounds on that cabin door on Harry's 11th birthday and says, you're a wizard, your life is about to change. Big adventures. 
And then finally, the James Bond movies. They all have the same herald, the person who sets the, uh, the, 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 the plot in motion, and that is M. M calls James Bond into the office and says, we have a secret plan for you because somebody's about to invade the world. And James Bond goes off and heeds the call to adventure and change. So these angels were herald angels. They were here to give a message to the earth, but not just a message. A message to tell the people there is about to be great change. There's going to be a before this time and an after this time. This is a moment. Angels consistently appear in the Bible and the Old Testament. And usually when angels appear, we know God is about to act in a big way. In the Old Testament, we see angels uh, worshiping God in Isaiah. We see angels helping uh, Lot and his family flee into the desert. We see angels appearing even to help Daniel with war plans. Since angels are so important in the Old Testament, it's no surprise that God chose to celebrate the birth of a son with angels as messengers for the holy birth announcement. These herald angels announce the arrival of the newborn king to the world. And what does that mean for the world? The results of Jesus' birth, according to Charles Wesley, are peace on earth, mercy, and joy. Jesus is a king who enters into his reign not with terror and war and problems, but with a campaign of great joy. The birth of Jesus is a perfect mixture of glory and humility. Here's a newborn king who will bring peace to the world, but he's laying in a feed box. Here is Jesus, whose arrival is announced by choirs of, of angels, but they're singing to poor shepherds in the middle of nowhere. Here's Jesus, the sovereign Lord, but he's also the suffering servant. He's a lion and a lamb. He wears heaven's crown, but wins it with a cross. And then we get to the second verse. One of the most beautiful verses. Listen to the words without them being sung. Christ, by highest heaven adored, Christ, the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity, pleased with us in flesh to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark, the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. The second verse of hark, the herald angels contains one of the greatest mysteries of Christianity, which in theological circles we call the incarnation, which means God dwelling in a human. Charles Wesley tells us that God became veil, veiled in flesh. And to this, Charles Wesley says there's only one response. When God is veiled in flesh, you hail the incarnate deity. This is how I found myself at Philippians 2, only two weeks before Christmas morning. Listen to verses 5 through 7 again. Let the same mind be in you, that was in Jesus Christ, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. You see, when Paul wrote this chapter in Philippians,
Philippians, he was grasping something huge. That the incarnation, this glory, powerful moment, was just a demonstration of Jesus' humility. Jesus, who lives in perfect unity with God the Father and equal in authority, emptied himself and took on the vocation of a servant. But Charles Wesley goes on to say that even though it was an act of humility, God was happy to do it. His exact words of Charles Wesley are, pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And we discussed last week, Emmanuel means God with us. Jesus and God were happy to dwell near human beings, even though they had to take on extreme humility. One of my favorite theologians and personal heroes in the world is a, was a young pastor called Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's pretty brutal. In the 1930s, he saw the rise of the Nazi occupation, and what he saw was the Nazis closing down real churches and putting up fake state churches that held allegiance to Hitler and the Nazi party over God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer began uh, an underground seminary training ministers to be real ministers preaching God's word. But of course, it didn't last long before the Gestapo found out and shut it down and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was forced to flee. Unlike a lot of people who fled the Nazi regime, Bonhoeffer had a place that he could go and a place where he was welcome. He began teaching at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He was safe. Everything should have been fine. But his conscience would not allow him to remain in the safety of the United States when so many of his brothers and sisters were suffering in Germany. And so he made the decision to go back to Germany and continue to fight. A decision that I can't even imagine what any of us would do. Eventually he was arrested for a plot to assassinate Hitler, which he has admitted that he did for the greater good or attempted to do. For the next 18 months, Bonhoeffer remained in a Nazi prison. And thank God for this time because what he did in this prison with no other thoughts around him was able to zero in on deep theological truths. And he's not the only one. We have a history of some of our best writings coming from people in prison. Letter from a Birmingham jail. Almost all of Paul's writings and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He lived his life for 18 months in that prison until one week before the Allies came to free it and he was hanged. But he left us with some incredibly powerful revelations. Listen to one of my favorites. He wrote, And that is the wonder of all wonders, that God loves the lowly, that God is not ashamed of the lowliness of human beings. God marches right in. He chooses people as his instruments, and he performs his wonders where one would least expect them. God is near to lowliness. God loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak, and the broken. I take Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words even more to heart today because I can't help but draw a comparison of a man living in perfect safety and comfort in the United States, but choosing instead to 
ally himself in a place of danger, in a place of insecurity, in a place where he would be hanged naked with six other men, treated with absolutely no human compassion, just like our Lord. God loves us so much that God wants to be close to us. And unfortunately, God can't do that in God form. We're too frail to be directly in God's presence. But God failed in flesh that we can look upon. And here's the big mystery. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 18 tell us something very important. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. This then is the joy of the Christmas story and the joy of the words written almost 300 years ago by Charles Wesley. God laid aside God's glory just so we could see God with an unveiled face. And why was that important? Because seeing God directly allows us to reflect God's spirit to every single person we come in contact with. Hark, the herald angel has come to tell you here in Tuscola in 2022 a message. Great change is coming. An adventure is coming. We have a calling, and that calling is to mirror back God's presence to every single person we meet. Tired at the grocery store? The clerk is probably tired too. Mirror back God's presence. Angry at inflation prices. Look around, your church members are also angry. Look at them and mirror God's presence. Exhausting from a post-pandemic world. So is everyone. Look around and mirror God's presence. And on those days when you're so beat down and so beat back that you cannot mirror God's presence, then we connect back to God and recharge as we simply sing glory to the newborn King. Amen. Would you stand and now sing the most beautifully theological hymn in the whole hymnal, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Christian, the chorus of One Holy Night in Bethlehem.